am so excited, and I will be brief about this because there's two of you, to introduce our two wonderful professors and artists who are speaking tonight, Tetsuji Aono and Luis Flores. So um, I don't know who's going first, but I'm going to go in alphabetical order by last name. So, but both of you are incredible sculptors. They've seen both of your work. You guys rock. With very distinctive vision and an outrageous sense of humor. Both of you are active in the art world and respected by your peers. Both of you are talented instructors here and elsewhere. And both of you are alumni of Los Angeles City College.
coming here to LACC. And uh, in the beginning, I, I, I always knew that I was interested in art, but you know, as most parents do, they are always concerned and advise you to study something else that's going to be a little bit more economically uh, viable and, and give you some sense of security. But um, so I tried a lot of different things while I was here. I did architecture. I, I always sort of staying in uh, within the sort of like the art realm or somewhere where I could be creative. So I took architecture, interior design, you know, a bunch of other stuff, film. Um, but I kept coming back to art, and so um, I, I stuck with it. I decided that I was gonna like I didn't care what my parents said, and I was gonna do art, and hopefully, you know, it all went well. Um, so a lot of the images that you guys are looking at right now are images that I are images of work that I made when I was here. I was really interested in portraiture. Um, I was, for me, when I first really dedicated myself to making art, I was I was really interested in sort of perfecting my craft, perfecting some form of craft. So for me, drawing was the was the beginning. It was what, what I was really interested in doing. Um, and for me, it was like if I can draw a portrait that's really, really, really great and looks realistic, like I've made it. Um, and so that's what I that's what I did. That's what I did uh, when I was here at LACC. And so a lot of the work that I made was in this sort of neoclassical style. A lot of portraits doing things like this, it's lost self-portraits, um, still life painting. This is, I, I, yeah, this, I made, I definitely made this here. Um, <laughs> and this, uh, I'm gonna skip around a little bit. Interested in color pencil and sort of just trying to learn, learn, learn. I wanted it to be like smooth and good, for it to just look aesthetically pleasing. Um, and so while I was here at LACC, that was uh, a lot of what was being taught. Um, a lot of it was sort of like very, a lot of fundamental stuff. Um, there wasn't really a lot of conceptually driven discussion um, that was taking place at the time. Um, and when I decided to transfer, uh, or when it was time for me to transfer and move on, I, I ended up going to LACC, or excuse me, to UCLA. Um, and I, when I got there, um, it was it was really different. It was it was a different situation altogether. The people were different. The language that they used was different. Um, the faculty was different. The things that they were talking about was different. Uh, and I found myself in a foreign environment that I had no idea sort of how to deal uh, with. Um, I went to school with a bunch of rich kids that had really great educations um, and were able to use this very esoteric language to make you feel excluded and not really understand what was going on. And I, I've always sort of struggled with like whether or not that was intentional or whether that was just like part of our nature, but it, I, I felt excluded from the very beginning. Um, luckily for me, I uh, my very first studio class at UCLA, um, I took with Barbara Kruger. And mm -hmm. Barbara Kruger was an amazing mentor to me. And uh, one day, I was taking a new genres class with her, and one day I remember it was break time and I was sitting there um, and she was staring at me. What the hell am I doing? I'm just sitting here, why is she staring at me? And she's just staring at me and staring at me. And finally she, she gets up and she calls me over to her. We go to the corner and she's like, I want you to talk about the class. I want you to, um, to say the things that you've been saying, but every day, all the time, because all of these kids that are here are listening to you speak and they have no idea what you're talking about. You're exposing them to all these different things that they have no idea what it means to know where you come from and, or to, to have the experiences that you've had. And so for me, that was like a really important moment for me. I, and I should also kind of back up a little bit. I had really great faculty here. There was, I want to do a lot of shout outs, right? Um, <laughs> I had a really great uh, teacher here by the name of Rebecca Ripple. Um, some of you guys might know who she is, but um, she was teaching here when I was here, and I remember Rebecca, it was the same sort of situation. We were in class, and she pulls me out of class and talks to me in the hall. She's like, you need to go to a really good school. You need to go to a really good school like UCLA. 
And it was like she had set something in stone for me, like that's where I was going to end up. And so, um, that, going back, just wanted to throw that shout out. Rebecca Ripple, love her, amazing. I owe her so much. I learned so much from her. Um, but when I got to UCLA, it was Barbara Kruger that sort of like really was advocating for me to, to sort of stick a claim in school, stick a claim in, in what I was doing. And so it was that from that moment on where I was just like, I don't know, but I'm going to do whatever I want, and people are just going to have to deal. Um, and so, uh, so this is work that I was making when I was at UCLA. Um, this is like one of the first pieces that I made. It's called My Dick is Bigger Than Yours. Um, it's this sort of giant condom that I made um, out of canvas. And so this, to give you a sense of scale, it was about like this tall, just lying on the floor. Um, and so it was at, all right, let me back up a little bit more. I had no idea, when I, when I got to UCLA, I had no idea conceptually what I was doing. There was, to me, the content wasn't a thing, right? So when I showed up at, LA, at, at UCLA, I showed up just no, having skills on like how to make things, how to, how to do, <clears throat> but I had no idea how to use my mind to um, create content, at least in a way that I, that, 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 that made sense to me, right? So all of these the things that I was making before were kind of just like, I'm gonna do a portrait. Dope, you know, um, and so when I got to UCLA, that's when I really started to learn the conceptual nature of art, and I started to learn how people were using ideas and manipulating ideas and manipulating mediums to create other ideas or to break things down or to sort of get people to arrive in a mental place that they wanted them to arrive in, and so. Um, one of the first things that I made, or I realized very quickly at UCLA that what I was mainly interested in was masculine culture. And so the majority of my work deals with masculinity, masculine culture, and masculine identity. Um, and so this was my sort of like first um, experiment with, with, with that idea. And so I decided to make this giant condom because I thought that there was an absurdity to it. A lot of the, the work that I made at the very beginning was this sort of like absurdist, just kind of ridiculous, um, like who has a dick this big? Who who thinks that they have a dick this big? You know, and there's a lot of dudes that think they got some real big dicks. You know, and so to me it was just like it was really funny. It was sort of poking fun at at, at, at this this idea of masculine culture, this sort of like macho uh, way of of parading around or, or, or carrying yourself. Um, and so then I made, I started also making these, uh, these paintings at UCLA, uh, where <laughs> this was the sort of like first iteration of using my image or my body in, in my work, which you'll see is like all of my work now. <laughs> um, and so I was really interested in sort of like continuing the, and exploring these, uh, these ideas of, of like of male sexuality, of, of macho culture, and so, to me, it was really funny to create these uh, these images of like my head on the tip of my dick, you know, <laughs> it's like I'm making out with it. And, and so there's this idea of, of, of like having this connection to the phallus, and, and that is very normal, I think, in male culture where it's just like your dick is everything. You treat it like it's this. this this God, you know? And so I wanted to sort of tease that out a little bit and, and just push it as far as I could um, with how stupid and ridiculous but funny and like serious it also is. Um, and so I started making all of these different paintings. This one is called Only I Am Worthy of Fucking Myself. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I got real, there's a lot of narcissism in, in the work. Um, And then putting my head on a female body as well, uh, along with the male body. So I'm, like, it's a lot of playing and experimenting for me. Um, where am I? Okay. So then this was my, this was this was the beginning of what I kind of do now. When I in 2007, when I was at UCLA, Barbara Kruger uh, had me go see this show that was at. The Mocha Geffen, and it was this feminist show called Black. Um, and when I went to go and see that show, 
it was sort of like, it blew my mind. It was like very sort of like, what? Like, what's going on? The, the work that I was seeing there, and so I'm going to take another step back. Um, I don't know that I'm remembering things exactly like how they were. Like, my memory is my memory, and I, I bought the catalog for the show, and I have intentionally not opened that catalog because the way that I remember that show has helped me so much that if, it, if I'm wrong about everything, like, I, I don't want to know. So, um, when I, when I went to go and see that show, it was really interesting for me because I saw a lot of work that wasn't being championed in galleries at the time. Um, I, was, I saw a lot of work that, for me, was just kind of like, why, how, why am I only seeing this for the first time now? Um, and there were some artists that were utilizing different materials and different mediums that I had never seen before, and Garn, Garn was one of them. So there was like a little seed that was planted for me at the time. Um, and that later grew into, this was my, my thesis exhibition or my senior show, I, I don't know, whatever they call it now. Um, where I decided that I was really interested in making this mask out of crochet. I was really interested in utilizing this feminine material and feminine mediums to make masks in objects. And um, I was interested in sort of creating this mask that was in my likeness and was trying to sort of be me but could never actually be me. And so there was a lot of this... Has it, for those of you that have seen the Golden Compass, there's something there. There was something in that film that I saw that, um, for me, kind of always kind of stayed with me. Where the polar bears are trying to be like the humans, or they're trying to have a soul, and so they're enslaving these little creatures to sort of be soul. And they were they were trying so hard to do all of these different things to try and be something that they can never be. And so for me, like this mask became that 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 object. This 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 thing that is trying to be me that can never actually be me. And so I created this mask and I sat in the, I sat in, in a chair in the gallery and I put this mask on and I just sat there for the duration of the, of the opening. So for, for like about two, two or three hours, I just sat in this chair wearing this mask. Um, and so here you can see like me, I'm putting it on for the first time here. Um, this is what it looked like. And then I take a year off. I graduate, I take a year off. Um, after I graduated, I was working with, uh, with a company that, me, I was working with a company that <coughs> uh, dealt with uh, students with mental disabilities. And so I worked, I worked there um, working with students with disabilities and um, doing community integration and, and I, I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about my. I learned a lot about patients too. Um, and so for a year I did that, and then I decided to go back to school. And I was like, I'm going to be a teacher. So I went back to, to school, and I ended up at Cal State Long Beach on uh, the the credential program there. And I was there. I, I did the program, but while I was there, I realized that one of the things that was lacking for me going back to to school was that. There was no discussion of the contemporary art world. There was no, There was nothing that I could talk to. But it was just absent in, in that particular program. Um, unfortunately, because I was in the arts education program, they wouldn't allow me access to any of the art programs, which I never really understood. Um, and the faculty there didn't really know anything about the contemporary art world and what was happening at the time. So I, I, I felt this desire to, that I needed to continue having the conversations that I was having at UCLA. Um, and uh, so I called Barbara Kruger, <laughs> like, <laughs> tell me what to do. Um, and so I, you know, I talked with her and I mentioned that I was interested in going back to get my MFA. And she was the one that was like, you should apply for CalArts. And I'm like, no way, I would never apply for CalArts. That's, that's a private school, that's a rich kid's school. Like, I can, no. She was like, you should apply, you should apply. Uh, you never know, you might get scholarships. And sure enough, I applied, I got in, and I got, great scholarships, and that's where I ended up. Um, so, yeah, so then I arrived at, at CalArts. Um, and my body of work, when I first started there, I wasn't really interested in crochet. Like, did, that thread didn't sort of continue. It kind of, I started thinking about other things. And so, in this video, I made this video where I, I became really interested in repetition. I became really interested in how repetition functioned. 
um, how like day after day you do something to sort of convince yourself of an idea or a thing and how that happens like on a, on a much bigger scale, like the way brands work and the way um, you see the Nike logo and the way that Nike symbol has meaning and power. Like if you just see that symbol on the wall, it means something, but it only means something because it's been repeated over and over and over again. And so I started thinking about this repetition. Um, am I okay on time? I, I don't know where I am on no, time. Okay, all right. I'll, I'll just, all right. So um, I made this video where that, that's entitled I'm Handsome. Um, <laughs> And uh, I'll just play like a short bit of it. It's the, there's no sound. I'll just mute it. There's no sound. It's a black and white. And so there's two videos that are overlaid on each other. And so I was really interested in like this idea of what it means to be handsome. Obviously, like I'm pretty handsome, um, <laughs> and so that's sort of like what you do to uh, to convince yourself of this, and not only to convince yourself, but to convince everyone else. You know, to con the, like the morning rituals that we go through to prepare our ourselves for ourselves and prepare ourselves for the world, because the way that we present ourselves to the world is, is everything. You know, in a, in a lot of ways, it's, it's the first thing that that people do is they see you before you speak, before you shake their hand, they see you. And so I was really interested in sort of in, in these rituals where like when I used to care more about my appearance and like doing my hair every day um, and working out, I used to still work out because healthy, you know. But um, I don't try to be healthy anyway. Um, these rituals, these, these rituals that you sort of so for me it was about this exploring this idea of repetition. I was looking at a, a lot at like Vito Okanji, who for me. Uh, one of the things that I love about his work, or that I do love about his work, is he's, you see his videos and he's trying to convince you of an idea that, that there's somebody under the table or that he's gonna punch you if you go down the stairs or hit you with a stick. And he repeats these things over and over and over again, and sometimes in very violent ways, sometimes not so violent, but there's, there's this repetition. And you hear it over and over and over again. Um, and so I became really interested in that. And that sort of led, led me to um, thinking about branding, right? <clears throat> thinking about branding and how like, I can utilize these marketing tools to brand myself in, in, in some kind of way. And so the outfit that I wear now, the outfit that I wear everywhere <clears throat> is this. It's my, my Vans, my, my Levi's jeans, and my blue t-shirts, my AAA blue t-shirts. I wear this outfit and my LA hat. If I'm not, well, sometimes I'm not wearing a hat, but usually if I am, it's an LA hat and it's blue. It's always blue. Um, and I became really interested in this, in this idea of like, what would it mean to brand myself? How would I do that? Um, and it also became like a functional thing where it's just like, I wake up in the mornings and I'm not spending half an hour digging through my clothes. I know exactly what I'm going to wear um, every day for the rest of my life. Maybe I don't know. It might change, but. For, for now, I don't, I don't see it changing anytime soon. So, um, let me see. I'm going to skip this one. And I'm going to move to this video, okay? So here you begin to see the uniform. This is where it sort of like first makes an appearance in the work. Um, and I want to let this one play and I'm not going to talk because it's great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
there's just something so beautiful to me about that about that sculpture that for me it's probably like the best sculpture of all time. Um, and so I decided to replicate that sculpture, but using my own body and now using um, using this, this this materiality, this yarn, uh, to create the, this this sort of like tortured, beaten uh, boxer. Um, and so for me, it was when I made it, I was thinking about these ideas of how like a lot of the things that I've learned about what it means to be a man are things that I've learned, you know, through. Uh, through those that came before me, through my dad, through my uncles, through people, you know, people that I had a chance to interact with. And so the title of this piece is Breaking Stones, Polishing Rocks. Um, and the title sort of refers to the Gustav or Ways of Stone Breakers. But what was interesting about it to me is um, I started, when I started investigating or doing research for this work, I, I started to pick out these different sort of events that I had witnessed at some point in my life, um, and I started calling them masculine rituals. Um, one of them being, like boxing to me is like this masculine ritual, right, where you have these two men that are training for months and months and months, right, they're going through a lot of physical training, trying to uh, increase their chances of being able to sustain the abuse um, that the other fighter is going to inflict on them, but also being able to throw punches, being able to sort of like be able to deal, right? But also going through an emotional sort of uh, experience as well, preparing themselves emotionally and mentally for the fact that they know that they're going to have to face someone in the ring that could potentially be knocking them out. Um, and so, uh, and then also thinking about, uh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So thinking about that, thinking about how boxing functions, but when these two men get in the ring together, right, they start fighting, um, and as the rounds progress, right, as it gets later and later in, in, in fight, you get to round 10, 11, they're both exhausted, right? If it makes it that long, they're both exhausted. And they have these moments of like this embrace where they're like hugging each other, they're, they're in a clinch where they're sort of like both equally taking a half a second to just like take a breath and rest and then only to be broken up and to continue the fight. Um, I, was, I became really interested in how these rituals of masculinity are sort of like, there's this hyper aggression or this, this hyper-masculine assertion that takes place in the beginning, right, because they're all throughout this hyper. They're pumping iron, right, they're getting, they're getting, they're working themselves up, they're preparing themselves for months, being they're talking shit to each other. Um, only to arrive at this point where they're both exhausted and then the fight is over and then both of the men then are able to usually look at each other in a, in a way where they're like, oh, congratulations, man, you made it through. And they, they exchange the respect that they have for each other. And it became really interesting for me to sort of think about how a lot of these masculine rituals, they need that hyper-masculine assertion in order to arrive at a vulnerable place, in order to arrive at a place where you are able to um, tell someone how you really feel. To, for a man to tell another man, heterosexual um, men um, in particular, to tell each other that they love each other, you know, or that they have respect for each other. But it's only in, uh, until that masculine assertion takes place. And so another good example of that is Drinking these drinking rituals, right? When groups of men get together, talking all kinds of shit. I make so much money. Um, I have a great job. Like I can fuck all of these girls. Like all of this very sort of misogynistic, um, very just like a lot of peacocking. A lot of like they're all trying to impress each other. Um, and then uh, they start drinking. One beer, two beers, three beers, four beers, five beers, and eventually they're drunk. And, oh, I love you, you're like my brother. <laughs> you know, like there's this sort of, there's that vulnerability that is able to come through, but it's only after this, um, this assertion has taken place. Like they're not able to arrive at this vulnerable place um, before. They're not able to just like be sober or whatever and say, hey man, I really care about you. And so, but yeah, and, and that, 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 now that has me thinking a lot about how like there's this new phrase that a lot of young men use where they'll say, hey man, I really care about you, but no homo. There's this sort of like, this fear or this homophobia that, um, this fear or, or this idea that being vulnerable for some reason means that you're gay. And I don't, so it's something that I'm, that I'm trying to figure out why things function in that way. So anyway, um, a lot of the work that I was making, so, so this, with this piece, I was interested in that. I was interested in those ideas, right? Of like these men, doing these things, yeah, I'm losing my train of thought a little bit, but that's okay. 
Um, so here's, I'm just going to show you some uh, details. And so all of these figures, or this figure is, is life-size, it's modeled after me, I used my body to make it. Um, and yeah, this was sitting in the gallery, this was at CalArts, this was my last show at CalArts. Um, and it was sitting in the gallery and they just, they just lived there, or were living there for a time. All right, graduate from CalArts, and then I had my first show um, outside of school, and that was with Rice Bench. Um, it was the price bench up until maybe like two years ago and a half. Um, but I should I think it's important for me to, to note that like I, not until recently I feel like I actually know what I'm doing. Like I have a, a very clear understanding of what I'm doing. Um, all at this point, like I, I know what I'm doing, but I'm kind of like still figuring things out as I'm going. Um, I know that I, I know the umbrella that I want to sort of fall in. I know that I'm interested in this idea of masculinity, but trying to figure out the right ways to communicate has been has been a learning experience. And I, I, well, I'll talk about a little bit about that more later. But so I made this. I made the. Uh, I did this show, and the name of the show was uh, whatever you want it to be. And um, I was became really interested in language and how language functions. These are the only two images that I have. Because they exist on the website, but I don't, I don't have, I don't have documentation for them. But uh, uh, I'm really interested in language and how language functions. I'm really interested in how, like, the way that we create meaning. And so that the you can't really see. Let me see if I can zoom in. Um, I was really interested in like hand gestures and how hand gestures function. And so in this, these, this triptych here, they're all images of hand gestures that connote some kind of sexual idea. So like this one here is the shocker, this here is butt fuck, and this here is to fuck. Um, and so I, I'm just really interested in like how these different, and there was other images, other hand gestures in that show where I was just interested in like these arbitrary sort of like Symbols don't they don't really mean anything right, but we give them meaning so for me the whole show was about like Nothing really means anything, you know, everything is whatever we want it to mean um, And I don't even know how I feel about that still um, So then I'm just gonna move on to the next thing Okay How do I do the slideshow thing? I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Not that good on the computer. Oh, and I thought you were perfect. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> So I was really interested in sort of um, 
in, in this painting, there's something really interesting about, about this. Well, so when I was thinking about it for myself, I was really interested in thinking about the sort of dualities of like the horse and the rider, right? And thinking about myself as being the horse and the rider, like I am both of them, uh, and they both need each other. Where the rider is the one that's sort of like forcing the horse to charge forward, and the horse is, has to do what the rider says, or cannot do what the rider says, but they both need each other in order to arrive at, at a destination or at a point somewhere. So, um, and within this painting too, I was really interested in the horse's face in particular. I was really interested in like the sort of like terror for me that this horse is sort of experiencing. Like, look at that dude's face. Like, he seems scared. Um, and so, uh, I was really interested in sort of recreating that um, where there's this, that the, the, the rider is me sort of forcing myself to do these things and as, as the, the, the horse is experiencing this, like having sort of no choice, having this sort of sense of terror as well. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I'm gonna start to wrap this up. Uh, so now, the body of work that I'm making now, um, or I guess wrapping up right now, I became really interested in, in wrestlers, and more specifically, I was really interested in, in uh, um, WWF, WWE. Most people, I think, know what that is. You know, but, like they get dressed up in these costumes, and these characters, and they go up in the stage and they they wrestle each other, right? This is very sort of the actual way of uh, doing wrestling or performing. Um, and so, within wrestling, I, I was really interested in uh, how, I was really interested in the, the viewership of, of wrestling, and also thinking about what it was like for me when I was growing up. Um, I was really interested in sort of uh, how, in wrestling, you have these dudes that are all like muscly and oiled up, and they come out and the crowd just cheers, and the crowd was usually made up of of a bunch of men, especially uh, when I was growing up. It might be a little bit different now, but when I was growing up, it was like those dudes that were really into wrestling. Um, and the sort of the sexiness that a lot of these characters had, there's this sort of this huge sort of homoeroticism that's inherent in, in wrestling. But the viewership was very homophobic. And so for me, it was this, this, this irony of like these guys that would love to see these men parading around, wrestling each other, holding each other, doing, have these very sort of, I don't know, like there's just something about it that to me, like I just, I never understood why it was acceptable, and I still don't quite understand but why these things are acceptable within certain circumstances, but not others, right? Outside of that context of wrestling, like, you can't do that, like, get beat up, you know, like that's just, it's weird. And so, um, I became really interested in that. I became really interested in sort of um, uh, why why this sport functioned the way that it did. Um, but then also th thinking about when I started making these wrestlers, I started making them wrestling myself, and that's sort of like a thread that continued from the from the Napoleon piece, where it was, it, a lot of this was sort. I realized that a lot of the work that I was making at that time was um, me sort of being at odds with my own masculinity and masculine culture and what like what it meant for me to be a man. Because I still don't really know what that means and I, I don't know, anyway. Um, I'm getting lost in my thoughts, guys, sorry. Um, for me, making these wrestlers, wrestling each other that were all of me was about sort of me wrestling with my own demons, ideas, like, what am I doing? Um, and so I created a series of work where, uh, yeah, there are these wrestlers, so I'm just going to show you the wrestlers. This is my wrestling series. And so the, uh, some of these images are of my work in my studio.
I was going to do it this way. Yeah. It's going to be so much easier for me. Awesome. And then we'll arrive here. Uh, so I have a show up right now in New York. Um, and this is the installation shop. And so um, the title of this show is Another Thing That You Did To Me. Um, and the, so the way that the, t the title functions and the way that the show functions, for me, functions in, uh, on various different levels. On a personal level, the, the title is derived from a conversation that I had with my dad um, somewhat recently well, before the show was going to go up. And <clears throat> in that conversation, my dad asked me, uh, he asked me to tell him all the things that he had done to me growing up that affected me in a negative way. And um, lots of emotion, you know, <laughs> stuff was said, and yeah. And so for me, another thing you did to me on a personal level, this show is sort of like this, this modeling of like these bad behaviors, not just of my dad, but of my like, of my cousins, of my uncles, like things that I see, see on TV, and so all of this is sort of this culmination of like, these um, these things taking place, right? That I that I was observing when I was younger, and then there's there's a couple there's two things that are different in the show, and I'm trying to see if I can find a good image um, where. All right, well here this this guy here, right? He's the only one that's lying down <clears throat> and has this look of fear on his face. All the other ones don't <clears throat> don't have that. And um, in the show, also for the first time, I uh, I created a female figure, which took a long time for me to or to arrive there, where the, where she acts as more of a spectator to like what's happening with the dudes, right, and what they're doing. Um, and I was really so the. She's modeled after my wife, um, so for those of you who know my wife, you know that it's my wife. <laughs> I don't. No, you do. Um, uh, yeah, lots of stuff going through my head. Um, yeah, so for me it was just like this idea of, uh, I don't know. I'm, okay, so let me talk about how it's not on a personal level. Um, for me, the title is really indicative of, uh, of, of or, or for me, the title operates in a way that implicates the viewer, where the you and the me is not really known. That the you could be you, and the you could be somebody else. Um, but I also start to think about how the you and the me can also be the same person, right? Another thing you did to me, sort of thinking about that and saying it to myself, where like I do a lot of these things to myself, and I sort of perpetuate a lot of these ideas that I don't necessarily want to participate in. But um, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. And then, um, I'm here. I'm, I'm <coughs> so I started thinking a lot about, um, when I started to look back on a lot of the work that I've made, um, I realized that within the work there's a lot of violence in the work. Um, there's a lot of violence, and I couldn't figure out why. Um, but I've, recently, I, I, I saw this video on Instagram, um, where Jennifer Lewis, for those of you who don't know who Jennifer Lewis is, she's an actress. She plays the um, the grandmother on Blackish. Um, Jennifer Lewis said this. I saw a video of her, and she, she she said this thing that just when I heard it, it stuck with me. Um, it just stuck with me, and it's still staying with me. Um, she said. Uh, <laughs> she said, um, if you sit in shit for too long, it stops smelling. Um, and that for some reason that, that stuck with me, right? This idea of like, sitting in shit for so long, and for me I start to think about these figures, uh, the violence that's in them is like, uh, for, for me they were necessary at the time, but I, I feel like I've reached a point where I don't need to, to use that, that, this modeling of violence to create the work that I that I want to create and make the meetings that I want to create. But um, 
it was also like understanding complacency and understanding that like when you get comfortable, you become complacent, right? You get comfortable doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, and that doesn't allow you to grow and move forward. And so for me, the next thing that I'm going to be doing, so I'm doing a solo presentation at Freeze New York with, um, with the gallery in conjunction with the Museo del Barrio. Um, they're doing like a special sections in, in, in this art fair. For those of you that don't know what Freeze is, Freeze is an art fair that originated in London. Um, and they have uh, an iteration of it in New York. And they also have an, or just recently uh, have an iteration of it in, in LA. It, it just passed. But anyway. Um, thinking about that quote, <clears throat> I, I had this idea to make this work, so this is what's going to be going to, the, to, to New York. I had this idea to make this work um, where there's this platform, that this scaffold, right, there's these stairs that you walk up to, up to, and on this platform, the platform's like about six feet high, so maybe like about this tall. Um, there's going to be a figure of me uh, looking towards the stairs and then sort of like taking this leap of faith and falling backwards. Kind of like a trust fall. All of you guys used to watch Fox Point, all right? Trust fall. You guys know what trust falls are, right? Yeah, all right. So it's doing a trust fall, sort of falling off of this platform, and underneath that platform is uh, another figure of me sort of catching myself. And thinking about that quote where um, if you sit in shit for too long, it stops smelling. Um, where the leap of, like, we need to have that leap of faith and trust in ourselves to be able to move forward. Um, and so thinking about that quote in relationship to that work, where it's just like this falling back, and I'm there to catch myself, but also thinking about it in, within the context of this, of, of this special section now where it's all that important artists. Also thinking about that where it's just like, oh, we have to start trusting in ourselves and merging. Anyway, um, yeah, that's what the next work is gonna be. Um, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you mentioned um, feeling like you could fit in some of these institutional spaces. Mm -hmm. And um, give a shout to the earth and the school that you are. Can you speak a little louder? I'm sorry, I can't really hear you. I said that. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. That you mentioned struggling to fit into these institutional spaces. Yeah. Like you made me give a shout out to the people who are was there like a body of work that you did that I think you feel like you did the shit and like you can do this? Oh, all of it. So <laughs> from the job. Like for me, like, it was that moment where Barbara Kruger was just like, you need to talk more. Like from to me, then everything became gold. I mean, it was Barbara Kruger that was telling me to talk more. She's amazing, you know. She's a legend in the art world and makes amazing work. And for her, you know, someone her stature to, to pull me aside, for me it was a, yeah, it was after that where I'm just like, I'm doing whatever I want it's going to be great. You know, I'm going to just interrupt only because we have a second speaker. Yes. And maybe we'll save questions for sure. after our second speaker. And thank you so much, Luis. Work. So 30 some years ago, I was here as a student and sitting here. So it's a deja vu to coming back here. Ugly chair. Still here. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to be back here. Uh, so I got really nice, solid education here. Uh, obviously, was a uh, painting teacher, and also ceramics. Uh, Lee Whitten, he was amazing, um, and also he was art historian as well. And he was a really sharp, amazing person. So yeah, we had a lot of. Uh, fun and met a lot of great friends here. Um, I'm still friends with other people too. So, yeah. Uh, anyways, I went to Otis after LACC. I was able to transfer as a junior. So, um, to going to uh, public school, uh, private school to accept as junior is kind of hard sometimes. <laughs> so you have to really fight for. Yeah, so I had to fight and yeah. Anyways, yeah, I always wanted to take uh, Ralph Basser. He was the ceramics head of ceramics department head chairman. And yeah, so I was 
really happy that we were the last student of his. So, and yeah, he, he <laughs> um, there's a lot of um, <coughs> famous ceramic stuff to him. So, yeah. So, but his work was like all beauty and just, you know, controlling and all, you know, classic, traditional. And yeah, so that's what I'm, what I learned. <laughs> and oh shoot, I'm going back for it. And also another teacher was, um, her name is Pontip. You know, <laughs> if you Google her name, it's, it goes somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, her work is so amazing and you know, ridiculously, you know, um, details. Um, you don't see it when you just you see looking at the finished product, but you know, uh, each pieces are just each components are individual pieces. And if you didn't know ceramics, it's going to be so hard because it's a shrinkage, a clay's going to work. So she put some. Oh shoot. Okay, sorry. So put some. Uh, for example, each pieces are individual pieces, and then fire to the bisque fire, which is first fire, and then she reconnected this little metal dowel each pieces after glazing. So, uh, just technically advanced, and also she was she become my teacher, and uh, she was genius. Um, she's studio, so. Her studio is not that big, but uh, everything is reachable. So her studio is everything is rolling apart and everything reachable. And yeah, <laughs> so uh, just an amazing person. Okay. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in my oldest year, there was a big show by um, Car Karen Carson, sure. and uh, um, I was blown, uh, uh, yeah, the shock, but because of one person, she has so much variety, but her signature is everywhere, and like, bitch, you know, your signature is everywhere. <laughs> She's amazing. You know? uh, for example, something like, Yeah, she has some banners, and some say like birth and death, and in between, thanks, or thank you, or something. And it's just such a, when you're thinking about that concept, it's a minimalism idea, just, you know. So, <coughs> you have birth to death in just one page, and in the middle, it's just thank you. It's like, <laughs> it's silly, it's amazing, you know, I don't know, is that me? <laughs> Maybe some people have a similar idea that, you know, excitement seeing her work. Yeah. And, yeah, so <coughs> I was just blown away from, by her work. Also, I like the, another type of art, appreciating different types of art, which is performance art. And especially, I like this. Uh, performance group called Sankai Juku from Japan, but they are uh, based in Paris. So once in a while, once a two years, they come to Voice Hall or somewhere else to just perform, um, yeah, performance. So, and uh, how can I describe that? It's just like, like Frida Kahlo. It's like a beauty at the same time, it's, you know, grotesque. Um, paradise versus <laughs> hell, kind of all these just those images of you know beauty versus ugly, dirty. So, so that's what I like and kind of influenced me. Oh, okay. And Philip Cornelius, he was teaching at the PCC, and during my LACC time, we went to see his studio. Um, as a field trip, and uh, something that he said about art, um, he's trying to, uh, sometimes he tried not to make art, just let it happen, and I was young, and so it was like, wow, you know, that's interesting, it can be just 
piece of caca, you know, it would be beautiful. <laughs> so, a lot of things influenced me. Um, so, so, early time, I, I was making different things, exploring a little, lot of technique. So, something was traditional. Um, yeah, this was collaborated with my friend Ernie. Uh, yeah. I started using banana because banana is, you know, like Asian American symbol, <laughs> yellow outside and white inside. <laughs> so I started using it as a signature for myself. And some traditional throwing pots. And then I gave up on throwing because, you know, if you go to Asia, wherever you go, just maybe. <laughs> There's an ex <laughs> expert of you know throwing people everywhere and just there's no way I have that kind of discipline <laughs> I thought so um, I like it but you just you know give up on you know uh, to become I'm not going to compete against these you know uh, crazy technique technicians <laughs> yeah. so and then the first series I kind of start working was. It's called momentary capsule. Um, I use um, wine goblets and also uh, fun objects. So, okay. So this is backwards. A Tabasco bottle, little one, and bottle cap and wine goblets, but just chop off and just add some, you know, ceramics pieces. And also momentary capsules. I was kind of thinking about just momentary. That time it was hot, so this is called hot. <laughs> so yeah, some death image of little, little people. Um, and this was home. <laughs> I was uh, being homesick, so a little frog <laughs> in the little case looking outside. Um, this was a uh, sweet and groovy. Okay, so sweet and groovy. This was kind of neat. I, I want to experiment with time. So, um, time and also, you know, some other temporary objects. So, it was candy, so, and in the hot light, lighting, it started melting. So, sweet and groovy moment doesn't last long. So, it's kind of And also, uh, these actual pieces are really small, so I want to kind of blow up, so I make these photograph, photo images. I think 36 by, I forgot what's the name, so, so kind of make different physicality and, and physicality and relationship between, you know, body versus like small object that kind of blow up, so. Uh, my ugly office. Uh, this is deer, oh deer, <laughs> so deer's there, it was, I was talking about relationship, another cook coming out, <laughs> so, you know, the relationship, <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to just pour fast forward some, some of this stuff, this was be sin and be angry, what it is, but yeah. <laughs> so crash on. Empty dumpty. Yeah, empty dumpty was empty inside and also there's a actually this was bottle. Yeah. Um, my name is not Pepsi. Um, I was playing as little kids and just they start calling me Pepsi, so I'm not Pepsi. <laughs> Chupa, you see how Chupa in it. Um, and this was Bitch Bastard Liar. So these capsules are locked, but inside is. <laughs> yeah, I have to deal with these evil people. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I don't have that kind of thing. Bitch, faster, and higher. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, bitch, faster, 
husband's two days. And also I make this piece. Uh, it's a fake documentation of um, shoot, what's the title? Um, clay boy 96 who eats clay and this eats clay. So I was making uh, fake documentation of eating the clay and then pooping the clay with covered with mud, mud. Um, and then um, collection of poop <laughs> was in the capsule. Yeah. <laughs> Display uh, installation. Uh, this one was American Hero. Um, when I found out uh, Allen Ginsberg's America, and I was really interested in this writing. So um, it's hard to see, but clear case, and also there's a text behind here. Um, yeah, America, blah, 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 blah. You know. <laughs> and also, that time, 1997, there was the election, so, you know, Jack Kemp, blah, 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 and Ross Perot, Al Gore, Bill Clinton, uh, Hillary Clinton. So, these are the American <laughs> heroes, but at the same time, it's like, you know, <laughs> it was just a <laughs> so, so I made this series. So after, after I made this series, I went to see Richard Heller Gallery in Santa Monica. And then just, uh, he was having just, uh, no, uh, just not a, a casual show, group show. And he just said, why don't you just leave it here? <laughs> so then my my group show experience just happened and like <laughs> so that's my first uh, big uh, larger gallery <coughs> exposure. Yeah, and then once I set up and this uh, Asian people start taking pictures right away, I mean, it was a really surreal experience. <laughs> oh sorry, yeah, this is uh, Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. It's not Louise. <laughs> 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 uh, so, so individual capsules. Oh yeah, and these hero heroes are on the money. So if you see the coins, you're standing on the money. Oh, sorry, I'm going back to. So after these things, I kind of start changing my direction to a lot of Swiss, Swiss holes with uh, <laughs> slip casting uh, figurative things and yeah, combination of throwing some throwing pottery here so I use a uh, wheel as just a tools yeah, so <coughs> wheel thrown so but that was just kind of experimental and then yeah, yeah. Every country museum art um, creators bought this just right. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, what? And then I just start thinking about, you know, maybe I should make more or something close to that. So these are ceramics with panty holes. So you see, when you have panty holes and it's cut, and it's gonna start making nice round form. kind of experiment with that too. Okay, banana again, so <laughs> yeah, I made banana teapots, so but dysfunctional. So with poles <laughs> and, uh, spout and lid handles. And puppies. Puppies. <laughs> <laughs> More teapots. Happy banana. Yeah. And some. This was on the wall, but uh, so it's kind of ceramic. It's it's called suicidal ceramic because <laughs> you are against the gravity. So so these are on the walls. And I was making 
fountain. I, I like the food culture, so uh, this is kind of honey bear, and this is Bob's big boy, and like <laughs> molten salt girls, kind of. So, and in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> Water comes to the face, and then, yeah, so I am somewhere else. Okay, so I start interested in installation too. Um, me and my friend Dimitri, yeah, used to go go to Kmart and just start playing this all the merchandise. <laughs> I, used to do. I should be quiet you know, about that. So, yeah, and also my room was really <laughs> little, you know, it was 10 by 10 apartment, single apartment, so, you know, the space was always an issue too. So, we were talking about how can we make big installation from the little package, and especially ceramic, it's really hard to, you know, keep things together. So, yeah, so actually these three nodes, can be just fit in one box, and these uh, these are Martha Stewart toilet cover seat <laughs> to make a daisy. So. <laughs> so, and but these were crazy technical pieces. I broke two already. <laughs> yeah, this you know this was just one piece of log rock, and yeah. So, but it's connected one by one, so that was kind of a difficult um, challenge too. So you see this, so this is all hollow structure, so every rod is not just one piece. It would be easier to put one piece, but you, you put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, so what the whole piece has nine pieces together and combined together. Yeah, so and clay has shrinkage, firing, whatever. So yeah. My love and hate relationship with ceramics. <laughs> <laughs> so I need some objects. <coughs> yeah. Some installation. Yeah, so this was the piece I broke. I mean, another piece too, but <laughs> this was more pro fragile. Cool. Sorry. I haven't seen this for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. So, I got into interest in sports drink bottles. It all looks like phallic to me. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Powerade, Powerade, Gatorade, and something. So, they all kind of use similar shape. So I put the grapefruits next to each other. So. <laughs> and then we can just uh, worship. <laughs> <laughs> These are photo, photo collage, and actually it's taking a yeah, magazine and make a collage and take a photograph, so it's a secret, so it takes longer process. <laughs> you know, now everybody's doing digital, so yeah, this was before digital age, so okay, yeah, these pieces. <laughs> Technically, I get better, you can tell. <laughs> Everything's straight, clean lines. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and also, I was going to talk about the. Uh, I want to show a video of William Wegman's video, and especially, I was shocked that I thought he was just kind of calendar artist, you know, poster artist. And then when I saw his uh, experimental video of you know, dripping, uh, <coughs> dripping milk and then make a trace and then the dog is just start licking. <laughs> and
And I was like, wow, this is real art. And I was kind of not expecting to see that one. So, yeah. So, I got interested in making videos too. And she throws a command and
physical uh, acoustic waves, a system, whatever. Anyways, so I was mimicking the idea of the acoustic wave technology, you know, and then uh, stereo sounds, the mono sounds to come out, so against the technology. <laughs> So, I did another video. <laughs> and another video is, uh, I don't eat McDonald's, but I kind of love and hate relationship with fast food, McDonald's. Yeah. And also, we always hear this noise, uh, the car alarms, you know, the Viper car alarm in LA was obnoxious. <laughs> So it's the process is 
more than you think. <laughs> I don't know what happened to the malls. My third. More precise, uh, piggy banks. So these are. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and the mutation, you know, <laughs> if you're eating McDonald's too much, <laughs> you can have three breasts and two booty holes. <laughs> hypothetical, you know, questions and like kind of my brain exercise weird that way, so <laughs> um, yeah, experiment okay, so, yeah, some object with boxes so I made this kind of to make my maintain my income and to make my other crazy experiment. <laughs> but, yeah, so, the side show. I titled this show because I don't think anything's going to show the sale, but you know, some stuff is old, but yeah, because it's more experimental and it's kind of funny. Uh -huh. um, I made this wedding chapel <laughs> and um, with uh, this kind of razor disc and also ceramics. Again, same similar idea of the speakers. So normal sound speakers surrounded. So this was five channel speaker. One, two, three, four, five. And I had a friend who works at the real studio in North Hollywood. So we kind of recorded the whistle, uh, kind of waiting wedding march, whatever, <laughs> so, so you can hear the wedding march, but it's not a good sound system. So this is part of the installation, and I, I show some my students how to beating, so you see this, yeah, I used to love beating, more than eating dinner, but now, Speakers. And also, I still do painting sometimes. Um, so these are painted on mirrors. So um, it's still you're dealing with three D. Um, yeah, and when you are drawing on these, you get really dizzy because there's a depth in between the surface of the glass and then reflective <coughs> material that side. So there's a space between, so um, it's easy to get dizzy, dizzier, and more dizzy. Here, dizzy. <laughs> okay, so, and yeah, I like the food culture, so. Turkey, chicken, <laughs> yeah, squid, <coughs> daikon. Okay. Somebody knows me. I like daikon. Oh, and uh, bacon. I stay away from bacon, but <laughs> bacon tree. Okay, so just let's. <laughs> So, I got picked up by this men's book magazine, and especially in Bad Boys. <laughs> we have this 10 pop artists to watch. It's like me. So, so, I was in the one page, and funny thing was the shoes. You see a little bit of my shoes, and then this shoe company contacted me, and they gave me one pair of shoes, two, two more shoes, I don't know if it's good. <laughs> I wish that can happen more. <laughs> yeah, the kill company, please. Right? <laughs> okay, another solo, it's a I want to So, this was, yeah, 
you can see the relationship with um, some kind of performance. Mm -hmm. I wanted this kind of more theatrical, um, dealing with light, very performative, quiet, but performative. Yeah, so, yeah this banana is This time no glaze, so just everything just simple, minimalism, <laughs> negation of all the yeah, technique. Uh, another installation. I will always like Christmas tree and wonder if tree can grow like this way. <laughs> Inspired by Brancusi sculpture. So one goes up, one goes down, goes up, goes down. So creating a tower with teddy bears. And the details are like this. Okay, precious balls. Okay. So another hypothetical. You know, crazy drama and stress to be. So, um, like landmine, <laughs> and I'm losing my legs and arms. And, and here, actually, duplication of soccer ball, but actually my cat. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, she's my daughter. <laughs> So yeah, this is kind of exercise. It's like I want to make something that doesn't look like art at all. You know, so just kind of put things together. Uh, and uh, and I like the flower arrangement, but instead of flower, we can just put some balls, soccer balls, my shells. Distance, you see the flowers ish, and then come closer. It's a ball. <coughs> so, these are kind of non mine balls. <coughs> okay, now the place balls. <laughs> I tried to against my, you know, mentor. My mentor was, you know, making beautiful plates. <laughs> so that's why I learned. But just this is totally against the will. And then, but this is for un unhappy dinner plates. <laughs> so, so there's no agreement. <laughs> Bubbles, you can just project the words. <laughs> so it's a psychological exercise to the viewers, relationship. Um, this is called Swan Lake. Um, I collaborate with my ex. <laughs> so yeah, he was doing photography, he was a photographer. So he photographed these images pixies and then make photo decals and then fire onto the, the plate. And also this looks like a swan to me, this you know, handles. So kind of romantic romanticizing kind of facing each other. So this is the decals. So, kind of kissing. <laughs> I like the I like some magic thing too, like Indian magic. Um, so this 
Indian boys, American and Native Indian. I don't know if I'm in, in trouble, but. <laughs> Details. This is another suicidal ceramics piece. This is coming off the wall and a heavy piece on the edge. So. And this is the end. Can I ask for the questions? Okay. <laughs>
like I told you that you're forgiving, forgiving yourself of past failure or letting go of resentment from people who have wounded you? Um, for me, for me, it, the... For me, it was so when I when I heard that quote, I, I thought about a lot of different things. There was a lot of people in my life where that quote, like, I felt it, it, it was directly about them to some degree. Um, people that I that I see that are stuck, and then I started thinking about like, I started thinking about like what it was like for me here. I started thinking about like my students and like for how a lot of them are they feel stuck, um, and like. I, it's just been interesting thinking about that quote and how it like relates to everything for me. Where like especially with the students now, like I started teaching here four or five years ago, and there's still a lot of students that are here that started four or five years ago or have been going. And, and they're, they're, for me, it's like they're afraid of moving forward and like pushing themselves or challenging themselves to go to to want more things. And so for me, this idea of trusting yourself. Uh, it's not necessarily about forgiveness, it's more about like, you're the shit, you can do it. You know, like, you, you, you can do it, you, you, not only can you do it, but you have to believe that you can do it, but you also, there's also people along the way that will help you. Like the way that there was people for me, but it, for me it was this sort of leap of faith, like, I don't give a fuck, I'm gonna do art, like that's what I wanna do. You know, I'm, I don't wanna do something that's gonna be more econom economically viable, like, I don't wanna, I'm interested in other things, but I wanted to be an artist. And so for me it was, um. Yeah, it's like being able to trust in yourself, and, and yeah, it's just trust, trust in yourself. I just came with a part two question now. So, what's your, what I'm, what I'm absorbing is there's stages of triumph and there's stages of failure. Yeah. So there has to be a medium to bring yourself back into balance. Well, I think, the, the, for me, failures are just as important as the successes. I mean, I, when I was preparing for this lecture, like I didn't know how the hell to prepare for this lecture, first of all. Like, I, I, I don't know how to do that. Um, but thinking about, um, like I started thinking about, since I had to go away back, I started thinking about a lot of things. And everything that, every, I've realized that every experience that I had gone through was always informing the next thing. And then, but using all of these experiences also, like, a, I, there's a lot of fucked up things that I had to deal with, like, in jobs, like, with family, with whatever. Um, but I learned something from all of them. And because I learned something from all of them when I went to the next thing, it just made me more aware. It made, like, it just, one thing kept informing the next thing, you know? Everything sort of arrives where it needs to arrive, and it, it just, everything can help you. But I don't think, I think the problem is a lot of people don't see it that way. They see, like, failures as, like, oh. I have friends that are like that, where it's just like, oh, I'm a failure. Things aren't going my way, but um, not realizing that those failures are, are actually like, you're learning a lot about yourself in those failures as well. Right. Identification of that topic, man. It's, 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 it's just a circumstance of identification. So humor is a very important element for my work. I, I, I like 
it engages the viewer, you know, it, it, and it keeps them there, or it can keep them there. One more, how about just one more? Back row? Yo, okay, so I know you put a lot of bananas in your sculpture. Is that your favorite fruit, though? Like to eat? <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.